Good morning, and welcome to Central Presbyterian Church's online worship service for this Sunday, June 28, 2020. I'm your lay reader, Ruling Elder Zach Cosner. I invite you to download the bulletin for today's service. The link can be found underneath this video in the description on Facebook and on YouTube, or you can head to our website, www.centralprespb.com, click the publications link, and scroll down and click on the date for this service. Um, since you have downloaded the bulletin at this point, I invite you to turn your attention to the announcements found on the back of today's bulletin. We will continue with online worship services through the month of June. Uh, we continue to uh, pray that we will be able to see each other face-to-face uh, -face very soon. The Presbytery of Arkansas has canceled all summer youth trips. Fortunately, the Presbytery is offering to cover the $100 cost of Montreat at home. It will take place from July 20th through July 24th. Also, the Synod of the Sun is offering an online youth workshop July 13th through the 17th. Registration for that is free and will include a free t-shirt. Both events will take place online are for, and are for rising ninth graders, two graduated seniors, and interested adult leaders. If you have interested youth, please feel free to contact me through our social media channels. Look for us with the username Central Prez PB. The PCUSA General Assembly uh, wrapped up last night. Uh, if you want to catch up on all the happenings, you can head to www.ga-pcusa.org. Finally, archives of our online services can be found on Facebook and YouTube. Links to each are found on our website. Again, that is centralprespb.com. Let us prepare to worship God. I will sing of your steadfast love, O Lord, forever. With my mouth, I will proclaim your faithfulness to all generations. I declare that your steadfast love is established forever. Your faithfulness is as firm as the heavens. You said, I have made a covenant with my chosen one. I have sworn to my servant David. I will establish your descendants forever and build your throne for all generations. Remember that our Lord Jesus can sympathize with us in our weakness, since in every respect he was tempted as we are, yet without sin. Let us then with boldness approach the throne of grace and find grace to help in time of need. Let us confess our sins against God and to our neighbor, first using the prayer printed in our bulletin and then silently. Here we are, O God. We present ourselves to you but how little we trust you to provide, how we fear the path to which you call us, how wayward we continue to be. We have been slaves to sin, which lead to death. You call us to obedience, which leads to righteousness and life. Lord, forgive our lack of faith and loyalty. Make us obedient from the heart, generous to the people you send our way, and open to your bountiful grace. This we pray in the name of Christ, our Redeemer. And now silently. Amen. As people born of water and the Spirit, we have died to the old life, and a new life has begun. God's grace is poured out upon us day by day. Come to the water and remember your baptism. Be thankful and live as one who has been raised to new life. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Amen. Grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father and our Lord Jesus Christ. Glad you could be with us this morning virtually and I pray that the time will come soon when we will be able to meet again in person. Our first reading this morning comes from the 22nd chapter of the book of Genesis, beginning with verse 1 and proceeding through verse 14. Let us listen for the word of the Lord. After these things, God tested Abraham. 
he said to him, Abraham, and he said, here I am. He said, take your son, your only son Isaac, whom you love, and go to the land of Moriah and offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains that I shall show you. <clears throat> so Abraham rose early in the morning, saddled his donkey, and took two of his young men with him and his son Isaac. He cut the wood for the burnt offering and set out and went to the place in the distance that God had shown him. On the third day, Abraham looked up and saw the place far away. Then Abraham said to his young men, stay here with the donkey. The boy and I will go over there. We will worship and then we will come back to you. Abraham took the wood of the burnt offering and laid it on his son Isaac, and he himself carried the fire and the knife. So the two of them walked on together. Isaac said to his father, Abraham, Father, and he said, Here I am, my son. He said, The fire and the wood are here, but where is the lamb for a burnt offering? Abraham said, God himself will provide the lamb for a burnt offering, my son. So the two of them walked on together. When they had come to the place that God had shown him, <clears throat> Abraham built an altar there and laid the wood in order. He bound his son Isaac and laid him on the altar on top of the wood. Then Abraham reached out his hand and took the knife to kill his son. But the angel of the Lord called to him from heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham, and he said, here I am. He said, do not lay your hand on the boy or do anything to him. For now I know that you fear God, since you have not withheld your son, your only son, from me. And Abraham looked up and saw a ram caught in a thicket by its horns. Abraham went and took the ram and offered it up as a burnt offering instead of his son. So Abraham called that place, the Lord will provide. At his, as it is said to this day, on the mount of the Lord, it shall be provided. <clears throat> Our second reading comes from the sixth chapter of the book of Romans, beginning with the 12th verse and proceeding through verse 23. Again, let us listen for the word of the Lord. Therefore, do not let sin exercise dominion in your mortal bodies to make you obey their passions. No longer present your members to sin as instruments of wickedness, but present yourselves to God as those who have been brought from death to life, and present your members to God as instruments of righteousness. For sin will have no dominion over you, since you are not under law, but under grace. What then? Should we sin because we are not under law, but under grace? By no means. Do you not know that if you present yourselves to anyone as obedient slaves, <clears throat> you are slaves of the one whom you obey, either of sin, which leads to death, or of obedience, which leads to righteousness? But thanks be to God that you, having once been slaves of sin, have become obedient from the heart to the form of teaching to which you were entrusted, and that you, having been set free from sin, have become slaves of righteousness. I am speaking in human terms because of your natural limitations, for just as you once presented your members as slaves to impurity and to greater and greater iniquity, so now present your members as slaves to righteousness for sanctification. When you were slaves of sin, you were free in regard to righteousness. So what advantage did you then get from the things of which you are now ashamed? The end of those things is death. But now that you have been freed from sin and enslaved to God, the advantage you get is sanctification. The end is eternal life. For the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. <clears throat> 
Open now our hearts and minds, O God, by the power and presence of your Holy Spirit, so that as your word is proclaimed this day, we may hear with joy what it is you would have us hear, that hearing we might believe, and that believing we might live lives of richer and fuller service, glorifying you here on earth as you are glorified in heaven. Amen. We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. When the Second Continental Congress signed the Declaration of Independence, they laid the foundations of freedom on which this country would be built. Of course, freedom was just a dream for many, of our na for many at our nation's inception. The rights of slaves, Native Americans, and women were either dramatically limited or non-existent. But one of the things that makes this country the envy of so many nations is the fact that though we are flawed, and though our forebears were flawed, we strive to move toward greater liberty for all. When we are at our best, we as a nation move toward a more inclusive freedom, or as we say in the Pledge of Allegiance, with liberty and justice for all. Much of the unrest across the land today stems from the fact that systemic racism in this country, coupled with unspeakable acts of brutality by a few police officers, has served as a reminder that though we have come a long way from where we were in 1776, we still have quite a way to go before all of us are truly free. Still, the word freedom remains synonymous with America. Our great land remains the standard by which burgeoning democracies measure themselves and to which those under the oppressive yoke of dictators aspire. Women and men have sacrificed to defend our freedom and as we approach Independence Day, I believe it is important to ask ourselves what will you do with that freedom? What will you do with that freedom? Do you take it for granted? Or have you taken time to truly thank God for the liberties that so many people in the world can only dream about? What will you do with that freedom? It's also the question that runs through our scripture readings this morning. God in Christ has freed us from the bondage of sin and death. And Paul has some very clear ideas of what Christians are to do now that they are free. Therefore, writes Paul, do not let sin exercise dominion in your mortal bodies to make you obey their passions. No longer present your members to sin as instruments of wickedness, but present yourselves to God as those who have been brought from death to life, and present your members to God as instruments of righteousness. It is a call to obedient living according to the will of God. It is a call to become slaves of righteousness, a rather ironic turn a phrase when one considers freedom. But it is a call to respond to the grace of God with a firm and lasting commitment. And as long as the call remains in the abstract, it is a call that we can all easily embrace. But the difficulty comes when the call to be obedient suddenly becomes very concrete, very specific, when it entails taking a very public and unpopular stand against prevailing or 
outdated attitudes in the culture, when it entails surrendering everything and submitting solely to the providence of God, or when it entails sacrificing those things we hold nearest and dearest in our lives. Perhaps that is why so many of us have difficulties <clears throat> with our reading from Genesis this morning. What kind of God would demand the sacrifice of one of our children? What kind of father would set out to do as God commanded? It's natural to be scandalized by this story, horrified by this story, perhaps even angered by this story. Why would God test Abraham in such a way? Well, part of the answer lies in the fact that the Hebrew behind the English word for test can also be translated as to prove, as in the way that metals are proven in terms of taking them to their limits, seeing how strong they truly are. In fact, the Jewish medieval writer Maimonides noted that in this story, God sought to measure the extreme limits of Abraham's love and fear of God. What would Abraham do with his freedom? That's an important consideration because God never forces us to be obedient. We are given free will. We have the ability to choose rightly or wrongly, to choose God's will or our own conflicting will. And since God first entered into covenant with Abraham, Abraham's journey has been a roller coaster of both obedience and failure. God had come into the dead end that was Abraham's life and had given him a marvelous promise of a future in which his descendants would be a blessing to the world. But Sarah was barren at the time, which made the promise impossible from any human perspective. So Abraham and Sarah would be called upon to rely on God for the blessing. Accompanying this promise was the call to Abraham to leave all the security of the past and to strike out for an unknown land which God would show him, a land that his descendants would one day occupy. His initial response was to go as God had told him, but in the going and in the journey that would unfold over the next 25 years before God's promise would be fulfilled, Abraham constantly struggled with the promise under which he had been called to live. Soon after he received the promise, he allowed fear and cowardice to overcome his faith and trust in God. And so he gave Sarah away to the Egyptian Pharaoh to save himself, passing her off as his sister instead of his wife. And in that moment, he who was called to be a blessing to others unleashed a curse upon others instead. But God had reaffirmed the promise and continued to call Abraham to be faithful. Abraham and Sarah would repeatedly take matters into their own hands, trusting in their abilities rather than in God's. The most <clears throat> infamous example of that was when they sought to hurry things along with Hagar, Sarah's Egyptian slave who would bear Abraham a son named Ishmael. But after Isaac was born, suddenly Sarah viewed Ishmael as a threat to her son. And as we heard last week, Hagar and Ishmael were sent away. But God did not abandon this son of Abraham. True, he would not inherit the covenantal promises that would go to Isaac, but Ishmael would be blessed by God as well. And God would make a great nation out of his descendants. Through all the ups and downs of Abraham's journey, God had remained faithful. What was in doubt was whether or not Abraham would and could put his complete faith in God. <clears throat> and so, 
God put Abraham to the test. Abraham is commanded to take his son Isaac on a journey to a mountain in the land of Moriah and there offer him as a sacrifice to God. Isaac, his only son, his beloved, the child upon whom God's promises rested, was to be sacrificed. Give up Isaac and be left with nothing but God's call and promise. That was the test set before Abraham. If he followed through with what God commanded, then Abraham and Sarah would end up where they were so many years before, childless and reliant solely on God's willingness and ability to provide. One commentator puts it this way, faith says yes to the promise, which is no small matter, but it also says yes to the command which makes the promise only a promise. And remember, it was Abraham's faith that was at issue here. What would he do with his freedom to choose? Had God's provision and grace led Abraham to the place where he could completely trust God? Which did Abraham love more, God or what God had provided? We're told that Abraham sets out in faithful obedience as he had done in leaving the only life he had ever known so many years before. And the heart of the story begins to unfold when Abraham responds to Isaac's question about the lamb for the burnt offering. The traditional translation of Abraham's response centers on God providing the lamb for the burnt offering. But the Hebrew word translated provide is a form of the verb to see. So a more literal translation would be that God will see the lamb for a burnt offering. The implication here is that God can see in ways that Abraham and we cannot. That was a big step for Abraham because unlike the rest of us, Abraham did not know that this was only a test. We've noted that Abraham had responded in faith before, but that he had always managed to hold back in his obedience. He always seemed to hedge his bets, to reserve the right to take matters into his own hands when God was moving too slowly or in ways in which Abraham disagreed. But Abraham's response to Isaac shows complete faith in God, who alone can see what we cannot. Interestingly, the Bible is absolutely silent on how Isaac responded to Abraham's words. Perhaps that means that Isaac, too, had faith that God would provide. And if that is indeed the case, then we should note the importance of this conversation between father and son. To assert that God provides requires a faith as intense as it does to say that God tests. It affirms that God, only God, and none other is the source of life. The alternate ram did not appear by accident, by nature, or by good fortune. Rather, the same God who set the test in sovereignty is the one who resolved the test in graciousness. And the climax of the story is reached when an angel of the Lord stays Abraham's hand and the divine word comes down, now I know that you fear God, since you have not withheld your son, your only son, from me. Now I know. Those were God's words to Abraham. They don't make the passage any less scandalous. They don't resolve the discomfort inherent in the test. They don't make the passage any more logical. But we must remember that God is not a logical premise. We must perform in rational consistency. 
God is a free and sovereign Lord who comes as he will. As the high and holy one, God tests us to identify his people, to discern who is serious about faith, and to know in whose lives he will be fully God. God tests us to discern what we will do with our freedom. Like Abraham, we are called to put our faith in and be obedient to the one who sees what we cannot see, to journey into the unknown with only the assurance that God will show us the path, and that because God sees what we cannot, God is utterly trustworthy. That's important for us to remember because the journey of faith may take us into the realms of unspeakable tragedy. It may take us into circumstances we cannot control. God may ask the impossible of us and work on God's timetable instead of our own to carry out the impossible. The journey may not ever lead us where we thought it might when we set out, and part of the journey may be a test that will be our opportunity to demonstrate faith and obedience. But whatever the nature of the journey, whatever we do with the freedom God has so graciously given us, it cannot be our seeing that guides us. It can only be God's. As the book of Hebrews reminds us, faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. I believe that is the essence of faith in those two words. But affirming what one believes without putting that into practice is hollow faith at best. God has given us the freedom to choose. God in Christ has freed us from the bondage of sin and death. So we should not be at all surprised when God taps us on the shoulder and asks, what will you do with that freedom? To God be all the honor, glory, and praise forever. Amen. I would ask now that you would please join us and confirm what it is we believe using the words of the Apostles' Creed that can be found in your bulletin. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Let us now return to God our thanksgiving through our tithes and offerings. And again, our offerings will be taking place electronically. If you head to our website, www.centralprespb.com, if you go to the top of the webpage, look for the Donate Now link to your right. Uh, also, you are allowed to, uh, or we ask that you uh, mail uh, your tithes to 6300 Trinity Drive, Pine Bluff, Arkansas, 71603. It is right and our greatest joy to give you thanks, eternal God, for all the blessings that you have bestowed upon us. But we are most grateful for the gift of your Son, Jesus Christ, and for your abiding and sustaining Holy Spirit. For our Lord reconciled us to you and to one another, opening the door to eternal life. Your Holy Spirit continues to confront us, convict us, correct us, and equip us to enter the world and share the good news of your redeeming grace. And so, O oh God, we offer up our time, our talents, our treasures, and indeed our very selves for you to use as you see fit until that most glorious day when at the name of Jesus, every knee in heaven and on earth and under the earth shall bend 
and every tongue shall confess him, Lord, to your honor and glory. Amen. At this time, we're going to share our joys and concerns. Um, the only uh, prayer request we received this week uh, was from uh, continued prayer for Brad Von Tunglin. Um, he is continuing to suffer medical complications and um, is not feeling very well at this time. Um, we continue to pray for Brad and pray that he uh, receives a, a quick recovery. Um, we continue to pray for those who uh, have lost loved ones to the coronavirus, uh, those who are uh, battling the disease currently, <clears throat> excuse me, um, those who are on the front lines, our uh, first responders and our uh, medical professionals who are dealing with uh, patients who are um, uh, who have COVID-19 and um, those who work in the public, uh, we ask that uh, 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 a protection be um, placed upon them as they uh, deal with uh, going back to work and, and doing all of the, the things that they need to do. Uh, we also continue to ask for prayer for our, our country and our world um, through this tumultuous time. Um, we ask for peace and, and harmony in our land and for reconciliation. Holy and gracious Father, we give you thanks that the Lord Jesus Christ is in fact the same today as he was yesterday and will be for all of our tomorrows. We continue to ask for, uh, for your protection and for your healing power to be placed upon Brad Von Tunglin. We also ask that you heal those who are sick from COVID-19 and that you protect those who are treating those who have COVID-19, those who are in the public space for their uh, jobs, and please uh, grant serenity and, and the knowledge that you are there with those who have lost loved ones to this horrible disease. We continue to ask for you to be with our nation and our world during these tumultuous times, that you bring reconciliation to our world and that you bring peace upon our lands. Give us hope as we strive to be faithful disciples of Jesus Christ who taught us to pray together saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Now go out into the world in peace to love and serve the Lord, rejoicing in the power and the presence of God's Holy Spirit, taking today's message with you, and may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all now and forevermore. Amen.